This is Artist on Record. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube. Whoever you're searching, we're there. You're an artist on record, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. I am Stefan Adika, your host. And please check us out on Spotify, iHeartRadio. All links are in our descriptions down below. And the first Saturday of each month, we are doing a vinyl game show where we're actually giving away prizes, vinyl records. All you need to do is check that out in our all access VIP backstage pass on our Talking Wax tier in Patreon. Now, tonight we have a special story. It's a story about magic about believing in yourself. On this part one episode, we're going one-on-one -on -one with the legendary 2000 Rock and Roll Hall of Famer from turning a gig down with one of the world's greatest songwriters of all time in pop culture to forming and becoming part of the American response to the British invasion and also to influence bands like the Beatles and having legends like Johnny Cash and June Carter to cover his music with hit songs under his belt like Daydream, Summer in the City, and of course, Do You Believe in Magic? In the hot seat tonight, please welcome founding member of The Love and Spoonful, Mr. John Sebastian, right here on Artist on Record. You're not going to want to miss this one. Coming up next, bam! Hello, correct me, Bob Dylan was a friend of yours before he was the Bob Dylan that everybody knows. Yeah, huh? yeah, no, we used to get together in the basement of Gertie's Folk City because we were both tremendous fans of Victoria Spivy, or Spivey, uh, a blues singer who was a contemporary of the great jug bands, and I think probably uh, did some singing in organizations, not jug bands, but that included some of those people. Say my last wife. Uh, and uh, we were both sort of the only harmonica players in the village. And uh, I don't mind saying that when, when uh, I think it was Belafonte hired Dylan, I went, guys, the greatest songwriter ever, but harmonica, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I did play a Bob Dylan record for my father. Now, remember. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that Vila Lobos is writing for and Sheridan yeah. is writing for. And he listens and I said, Dad, this this guy is is great. It's he's expressing this really important thing. I'm trying to get it across. I put the record on and dad listens. <laughs> I can see he's really trying to stifle a complete, like just evaporating in laughter. And uh, so uh, I said, okay, you know, I'll give you the harmonica, but you know, check the lyrics. And of course, dad, who was a sensitive guy, yeah. uh, understood what this kid was after. And um, so uh, Bob and I had a, a, a kind of a friendship that ended up where he actually invited me up to Woodstock. It was my first visit here in 1962, where he was living at Albert Grossman's house. And I was sort of a uh, visitor on the ground floor in one of the, uh, one of the bedrooms. But that week was where I learned what it was to be a songwriter because that typewriter on the ground, on the floor above me was going and going. It'd be three o'clock, I'd wake up to pee and it's still going. Wow. So um, that, that really was instructive. And uh, Bob and I did a certain amount of playing, which was documented by a, a, a photographer that unfortunately, you had to wait a very long time for, uh, I think, Forever Young is the name of the, mm -hmm. the, of the 
photographic uh, book and uh, wow quite quite remarkable and so at the point where now, now we go back to where i just barely got the band together and we go out to a destroyed hotel in long island to rehearse it's the winter <laughs> it's really cold so you're, you're living in in the village and you're traveling all the way to long island to rehearse is that correct it's, i remember uh steve boone's mom is a real estate agent okay so she is able on several occasions to find us a place that nobody's gonna care if we're loud and you know like some kind of beach situation because so so we're working at this hotel and we're learning tunes and uh, i don't think i even had magic yet i just had uh jug band tunes that i'd taken the bad words out of and okay so we're just sort of you know going on like that and the uh house phone rings which startles us because it's the middle of the winter and there shouldn't be any calls coming in. I don't know how he got the number, but uh, I said, yeah, he, hey, hi, John, hey. So look, I, I'm just kind of thinking about going out on the road. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you could, uh, I don't know, you might want to come along and, you know, you could, I don't know, maybe play, maybe play bass. I don't know. You know, it's the vaguest come on you've ever heard. Dylan's <laughs> invitation to be in a band is the weirdest so anyway so <laughs> and, and i have to tell bob dylan after he does the pitch i have to say bob i kind of hooked up with these guys yeah. and we've kind of written a few things and kind of committed to this idea and i i really can't just bail and uh come along with you on the on the run and uh that was the last call i ever got from bob that Dylan. was the last call <laughs> <laughs> you get a congratulations from him all right well good luck congratulations all right wish you to mazel all this good stuff <laughs> yeah it was a little mazel yeah, yeah it was <laughs> okay wow now picture if it if you if you would have took that door with dylan the music together. I wonder what what would have happened. It's just it's like almost like a twilight zone. Let's see what would happen. Like, you well, know, I think it would have been pretty straightforward. I would have been a bass player. You would have been a bass player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, nobody's gonna be co-writing with yeah. you. Look how you you knew. You believed in what you were doing. You believed in magic. So and now for the beat of eleven spoonful. And you made it happen, yeah. but not just a legendary band that many people have covered your music. And the top of my head, Bobby Darren. I mean, come, think about the people who have covered your tunes. You know, that's Johnny and June. Yeah. <laughs> For me, Johnny Cash covering me. Johnny Cash. Uh, yes, that's a big one. June and I've been singing this song, our version of a John Sebastian song, "Darling Companion." <laughs> That's a I big one. Listen to so is that a, a, I'm John? John, John, is that the biggest one for you that you're like in your heart that the Johnny Cash and June, huh? That they covered your songs. That's the big one for you. Well, the, you know, it, it, Joe Cocker did something so different with "Darling, Be Home Soon" that uh, I mean, I, I felt really close to him, and in fact, we shared a lot of stages after Woodstock because all the people trying, we're going to do Woodstock, but do it where we make a lot of money and you know of course these would fail every one of them failed but it was an opportunity to get together with uh you know some cool yeah. cats you took the right door i will say that <laughs> yes. you picked the right door you know the price is right we're playing here one two or three you yeah. picked it you go we love and smoothly you're doing the band you're getting the hits are coming out okay um what was the first the first hit for you guys for Love and Spoon? Was, was Do You Believe in Magic? Great, great song. Tell me about the, the on that song. What was that based on? Do you believe in magic? It was based on working at the Night Owl Cafe 
in that period when we're still playing for a lot of old Italian guys that really would rather just sit there espresso and, you know. Really? Uh, yeah. And uh, But there was a few younger folks that were starting to penetrate. And I remember the night that a young girl was in the back of this club. Now, this club is like a shoebox, and you're in the middle of the shoebox. So you're always working this way and that way. It's, there's only one row of people in front of you. So I remember looking right into the back of the club and seeing this young girl dancing. Here a young girl song, how the music is freedom, whenever it starts and it's magic. And realizing, you know, she's not dancing the old way. She's dancing a new way. And to me, that was, and I said it to Yanofsky that night, I said, give us a week and we're going to be crowded with girls from Queens. You watch. And it was the truth. Whoever that was went home and told everybody. And the next week, wow. man, oh man, did we have a lot of people in that club. Wow. In another wow. week, we'd have Phil Spector in the club listening really yeah yeah wow. no, in fact phil specter was he it was a really interesting thing because darling phil specter's success is derived from an understanding of what he calls the teen sound a sound constantly enriched by echo chamber effects and a multiplicity of other gimmicks designed to effectively underline a pulsating beat. I don't have to have ooze behind it, okay? Let's forget about the intro for now. Let's just come right in. Because he came, he had his ear against the wall of the club while we were playing, and I don't know what he was getting off of that, but we talked a little bit after the show, mm -hmm. and... You know, again, <laughs> we're out of step. We're going, you know, we got this, we got this Norwegian guy, <laughs> Eric Jacobson. Uh, and, and, you know, we're kind of on the same trip with this weird old time music jug band thing. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Phil was very candid. He said, look, I, I'd love to manage you, but I, I mean, I'd love to produce you, but I, I just have never done anything that I don't own. I've never done anything that was anybody else's. It's always really mine. I usually have composed mm -hmm. or I've produced or something. So, you know, that was the most polite turndown we, we ever got. Uh, you know, because we felt, yes, as much as it would be fabulous to sound like Be My Baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sound that... Be my, be my, be my baby. The Hal Blaine... I made that album, again, digressing to before The Spoonful was happening, I was friends with Jacobson because we coincidentally took apartments adjoining each other. Mm. And uh, would I'd get up in the morning and, and we would often cross paths as we were going down the five flights of stairs. And I'd say, man, that, that was really cool what you were playing last night. And he'd say, yeah, you, you were playing, uh, you were playing that uh, uh, introducing the Ron Nets album and the Staple Singers first album. And he said, you know, what a great, you know, what great stuff. Uh, and, uh, so he said, uh, did you listen to what I was playing? I said, you know, I, I was. And uh, that guy's something. He goes, so, so, so tell me about what, what was your reaction? He, he suddenly, he flushes, he gets excited. Who do you think, you know, 
who, who can I portray this guy as? And I said, Erica, I think he's the best song stylist I've heard since Elvis. He flips. He goes, oh, that's exactly what I've been thinking. I go, how crazy. Who is going to figure this out? So I instantly became part of the team. <laughs> I played harmonica on most of Tim's demos, wow. as it turned out. But this was, of course, it was Timmy Hart. Still I'd look to find a reason to believe. Some wow. Wow. That's pretty big. You did a lot of work too. A lot of you did a lot of session side. A, a lot of people probably know because everybody you have the internet. But the, the Doors, another one you did. Another one you did. You did on on the uh, Roadhouse Blues. You played harmonica on that. Is that correct? It's more exciting, Freddie. Saturday's child. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great. I, I know everybody's excited about that, but but really, to me. Being having the opportunity to, to play with Fred Neal and uh, and Vince Martin and then eventually with just Fred was just a remarkable songwriting teach uh, teaching opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just learn how this guy it seemed effortless could come up with these simple tunes but they had they had a little switch to them they had a little groove that you know the folk guys kind of didn't have that yeah they, they had other stuff but they didn't have you know because fred you know really his background was rockabilly gospel he'd been in a gospel group you know all of this the really cool stuff yeah that made him be the guy that, uh, you know, wrote Everybody's Talking At Me. Everybody's Talking At Me. Great, which was the with, for Harry Nielsen. He, you know, he Nielsen turned That's that around and Nielsen made it his own song. It's he always sure heard did. No, no, it certainly did. When you can't, <laughs> you can't get nearly that low, you gotta go high. Only the echoes of my mind. Um, now let's talk about so the Love and Spoonful. So what what happened with the Love and Spoonful? You, you, you got you riding the hits. You're going on you're going on tour. You, you're playing. You're on the radio. Everything's going good. What happened with the, the this disbanded? Well, hey, you know, uh, two of my partners got busted mm. by please, folks, an ounce of pot. Let's be clear that is now purchasable in most of your states for about two eighty. <laughs> Or $300. Think about that. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, they, they, as a result of that, they had to turn in the dealer. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean the police. First of all, it was such a wrong bust. It started because there was a screaming woman call in the neighborhood. The cops saw two guys with long hair in a new rented car, and they pulled them over. And sure, there was a pot in there. Uh, and so, uh, so our plan was okay. Let's get this guy out of jail real quick. We'll buy a real expensive lawyer, and and it'll be done. So uh, we did. I mean, they did. This all happened. I didn't know about this until it was a fait accompli. It really was. Uh, I was in. I was in another city. I was in Los Angeles, and this all happened in San Francisco. Wow! So, um, so uh, uh, we did try to continue, and and uh, really the, but it was an impossible thing, and. I just, it was one of the most, uh, the most, the saddest moments of my life to watch my partner. And now on the air, you're going to give me a check for a hundred million dollars. Thanks, man. What a <laughs> From being the coolest guy 
just playing the coolest guy. When he played the Ed Sullivan show, he didn't even care. He's singing stuff that isn't even in on the, the tune, you know, really? all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> and now he's a fink. Wow. Ooh, overnight. And really, that really ruined the spirit for Zal and by extension, it eventually, you know, made the, it just, we just couldn't go on. I mean, I was still writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, John Sebastian. <laughs> and talk about the things we do today. And laugh about our funny little way. And I know that it's time I must leave For the great relief Of having you to talk to You're all beautiful Goodbye Ladies and gentlemen, John Sebastian I want to thank Mr. John Sebastian of the legendary Love and Spoonful for being here with us tonight. Also, please check us out on Patreon and make sure you subscribe and hit that bell to be reminded and click on some other playlists that you might not have seen. But until then, everybody, we'll see you next week. And remember, it's only rock and roll and we like it. Until then, who loves you, baby? We do. Now get out of here, you crazy kids. God bless you all. Bam. <laughs> Don't get wet, I'm wet.